On September 29, 1982, in a Chicago suburb, 12-year-old Mary Kellerman woke and complained to her parents she was coming down with a cold. They gave her two extra-strength Tylenol acetaminophen capsules. Shortly after that, they found Mary on the bathroom floor and rushed her to the hospital. She was dead just a little while later. Doctors suspected she might have had a stroke, but that's rare in someone so young. The same day, in another Chicago suburb, paramedics were called to the home of Adam Janice, a 27-year-old postal worker. By the time they arrived, Adam was unconscious. They rushed him to the hospital, but he died soon after of, of a suspected heart attack. That evening, Adam's family gathered at his home to make plans for his untimely funeral. Adam's 19-year-old sister-in-law, Teresa, had a headache. Her husband, 25-year-old Stanley Janice, saw a bottle of extra-strength Tylenol on his brother's counter. Stanley and his wife each took a couple of the capsules. A little while later, both collapsed, and paramedics were again called to Adam Janice's home. Authorities evacuated the rest of the family immediately, thinking there might be some kind of toxic gas leak or something. Stanley died that night, and his wife, Teresa, two days later. Obviously, the deaths of three young people from the same family at the same location were very suspicious. Forensic investigators suspected poisoning, and blood samples were taken from all three of them for toxicology. When someone dies unexpectedly, forensic death investigators routinely examine the scene and question witnesses, family members, or co-workers. This helps pathologists establish cause and manner of death. These investigators try to find links between circumstances, events, and materials surrounding the loss of life. When these Chicago area death investigations led to the discovery that Mary Kellerman and all three of the Janus family members had taken extra strength Tylenol before their deaths, police rushed back to the scenes and confiscated the bottles of acetaminophen. Forensic chemistry indicated several of the remaining capsules were tainted with very high levels of potassium cyanide, thousands of times the lethal amount. Johnson & Johnson, the makers of Tylenol, were quickly alerted and very rapidly issued an extensive product recall of 31 million bottles. But by that time, three more women in the Chicago area had also already taken the drug and were dead. 27-year-old Mary Reiner, who had just given birth days before, 35-year-old flight attendant Paula Prince, and 31-year-old Mary McFarland, who collapsed in her office at the phone company. Comparing the locations of the victims' homes, investigators thought it highly unlikely that they'd all purchase the medication from the same store. Investigators used the lot numbers on the bottles to see if they'd all come from the same manufacturing plant. They didn't. So Johnson & Johnson probably wasn't the source, either through accident or sabotage. Some of you might clearly remember the media attention in this terrible case. I know I do. The Tylenol poisoning was all over the national news and panic was spreading. But it was so important to get the word out. Chicago police cars traveled up and down the streets using loudspeakers to warn the public not to take Tylenol. Johnson & Johnson offered $100,000 in reward money for information leading to the capture of those involved. Investigators removed the product from store shelves across the whole nation for forensic testing. Only eight adulterated packages were ultimately recovered in this hideous death lottery. But who knows how many poisoned packages consumers could have thrown away after hearing about the recall. The eight tainted packages included the five involved in the deaths, two others returned to stores, and one found on a store shelf. A combination of store receipts and surveillance videos helped investigators figure out the eight bottles of tainted medication came from seven different locations. In those days, store surveillance equipment wasn't nearly as common as it is today. No usable fingerprints were recovered from any of the packaging or contents, and each of the eight bottles had from three to ten contaminated capsules in it. The best investigators could figure was that someone was taking extra-strength Tylenol bottles from stores, either stealing or buying them, then opening the gel caps, adding cyanide, and returning the products to store shelves to be purchased by unsuspecting victims. Now you can imagine how quickly forensic scientists and the Illinois Department of Health had to mobilize for this massive test of product tampering.
they developed a rapid test that was a small slip of chemically treated paper that could be put into a bottle. The strip would turn blue if cyanide was present. Now, we call these types of quick assays field tests or sometimes screening tests. They allow rapid presumptive identification. If a substance tests positive, it's then subjected to what we call confirmatory tests, which involve more sophisticated chemical analysis and high-tech lab equipment. Something investigators looked into was who could have gotten their hands on potassium cyanide. It is used in some industrial settings and in the mining industry, so investigators look for any leads in those directions. They also considered people who might have been disgruntled with Johnson & Johnson and maybe wanted to punish the company by ruining its reputation. The FBI and several Chicago police agencies came up with suspects, and about 400 people were interviewed. The first major suspect was a do-it-yourself chemist named Roger Arnold. He worked at the loading dock at one of the stores involved and had a weak connection to another store where tainted capsules were found. Tylenol victim Mary Reiner's father was one of Arnold's co-workers. So initially, police wondered if Arnold had some kind of grudge against Mary's father and maybe used the other killings to try to disguise his one real target. Investigators couldn't pin the crimes on Arnold, but he did end up having a mental breakdown from all the media attention. He thought a guy he knew from a local tavern had steered police to him, and Arnold decided to shoot the man. But one night outside the bar, Arnold actually shot a different guy that he mistook for his intended target. So that innocent man was really another casualty of the Tylenol killings. Arnold was convicted of second-degree murder, was paroled after 15 years of a 30-year sentence, and died in 2008. Anyway, while Arnold was being cleared of suspicion in 1982, the Tylenol investigation quickly turned to a more promising suspect. Johnson & Johnson received an anonymous letter with a New York postmark. The handwritten letter, while not te technically admitting to be from the killer, described how perfect the poisoning had gone and how simple it was to put the cyanide in the gel caps. The person claimed it required less than 10 minutes per bottle to complete the task and hadn't even cost $50. The letter said the whole plan was a, quote, beauty. This was because the bitter poison was housed in the capsules so couldn't be tasted. Plus, cyanide required such a small amount to be fatal and acted so quickly that realistically nothing could be done to save the victims. The letter told Johnson & Johnson executives to deposit a million dollars to a specific account at the Continental Illinois Bank in Chicago if they wanted the deaths and the bad press to stop. Was this letter really from the Tylenol killer or was it a prank? Or could it have been from an unrelated extortionist who wanted to capitalize on the poisonings? The bank account listed in the letter was closed, but had previously belonged to Frederick Miller McKahey. He was one of the heirs to the Miller Brewing Company and had run a Chicago travel agency that recently went bankrupt. But why on earth would a man put his own bank account number in an extortion letter like that? Could someone be trying to frame him? What investigators didn't yet know was that one of McKay's former employees, his bookkeeper, Leanne Lewis, and her husband, James Lewis, well, they were furious with him. They had even tried to sue McKay in the summer of 1982, just months before the Tylenol poisonings, because they'd been stiffed on a bad paycheck the travel agency bounced. Now, to get the full picture here, we need to go back into the couple's lives a bit. Although he was in his mid-30s in 1982, James Lewis's history included a really difficult upbringing and a diagnosis of schizophrenia. He had earned good grades in school and had been pretty involved there, but was known to have some serious problems at home. In his late teenage years, Lewis allegedly chased around his adoptive mother with an ax and beat up her husband before trying to kill himself with an overdose of anison, an over-the-counter pain reliever. He recovered at a mental health facility and later claimed the attacks and suicide attempt were just a ploy to get him out of the draft, since this was during the Vietnam War. Later, while attending the University of Missouri in Kansas City, he met and married Leanne, and soon after they had a baby with Down syndrome. 
So the couple opened their own accounting and tax service in Kansas City. That way they could have their daughter with them at work each day. Supposedly, the little girl would sit in the store window and wave at people on the street. Now, one day, an older man named Raymond West saw the child, stopped into the store, and befriended the family. West was a retired bachelor who lived in the Kansas City neighborhood where the Lewises had their business. He quickly became a tax client and grew even closer to the couple after their little girl died following heart surgery when she was just five years old. Some three and a half years later, in the summer of 1978, Raymond West made his usual Sunday stop at the local florist, and among other things that were discussed, he complained of not feeling well. That's the last time anyone saw him alive. Now, the death of Raymond West is a puzzle in itself within this whole Tylenol story, but I'll summarize it by saying that his decomposed and dismembered body was found in his home three weeks later in the Kansas City summer. Now, let's see how James Lewis connects to that. While West was missing, a concerned friend had tried several times to contact him. He went to West's house, and after seeing the man's unmade bed through an open window shade, he called police, who agreed to look into it. The same friend then returned a little later to West's house, only to find the same window shade closed and a note on the door. The note, on Lewis & Lewis tax firm letterhead, stated that Raymond West was out of town for a few days, and anybody who had questions could call James Lewis. Now, this made West's friend really suspicious, so he got police to do a cursory search of the house. They actually had to break the door lock to enter, but they found nothing really unusual, except West wasn't there. Later, when this concerned friend was putting in a new lock at West's house, James Lewis showed up to ask what was going on and the two men talked for a while. But when three weeks passed with no word from Raymond West, his friend used the key to the new lock he just installed. When he opened the door, the smell of decomposition almost knocked him over. Police came back and found things weren't exactly the way they'd been during the first search. Besides the smell, there was a bloody lawn chair in the basement and a garbage bag that held blood-stained sheets and West's hairpiece and glasses but the basement didn't seem to be where the odor was coming from. So they went back upstairs and saw a bloody stain oozing through the drywall on the bedroom ceiling. The dismembered body parts of a man assumed to be Raymond West had been hoisted up into the attic using some kind of a pulley system. As for positive ID, this was prior to forensic DNA testing. The remains were too decomposed for fingerprints and West wore dentures made by a lab that was no longer in operation. The body was determined to be his through a hair match between the little hair West had left and a hair found in one of his hats. Plus, of course, West was still missing. Now, how is James Lewis further linked to this gruesome discovery? By a check from Raymond West's bank account made out to Lewis for $5,000 and dated on the last day the old man was seen alive. When police brought Lewis in, he said the money was a loan that the bank didn't even honor anyway since they couldn't reach West for verification. Officers point blank asked Lewis if he had any of Raymond West's checks, and he said no. Lewis willingly submitted to a handwriting sample and fingerprints, and police let him go while they continued to investigate. The next day, officers went to Lewis's house and requested to search his home, his tax agency, and his vehicle. In Lewis's car, investigators found garbage bags and rope, like those at the crime scene. They also found some of West's personal papers and a pack of his blank checks. Lewis still denied any involvement in the man's death, but they charged him. Lewis's trial for the 1978 murder of Raymond West was set to begin in the fall of 1979, but the charges ended up dismissed due to some legal missteps along the way. For one thing, Lewis hadn't been read his Miranda rights, which rendered everything that was collected as evidence inadmissible in court. There were also errors in the legal filings. Besides, West's body was so decomposed that the county coroner couldn't provide either a cause or manner of death. So even if the prosecution could show that Lewis dismembered West's body and even tried to steal or extort money from the old man, there was likely no way they could prove Lewis killed him.
Although James Lewis was free, police were determined to try to find some way to put him behind bars. They continued to investigate his tax business as well as other ventures Lewis partnered in, one of which, coincidentally or not, involved the import of machinery used to manufacture pills. By the end of 1981, authorities had amassed enough evidence to get a search warrant for Lewis's home. They collected files as well as typewriter ribbons that I assume they were going to use for ink comparisons on some question documents. But this time, rather than waiting around to see what happened, James Lewis and his wife went on the run. They left Kansas City for Chicago, where the couple assumed the names Robert and Nancy Richardson. That's where Nancy, who was really Leanne Lewis, went to work for Frederick Miller McCahey's doomed travel agency. Now that was quite a sidetrack in the investigations of the 1982 Tylenol killings, but I think it's an important one. It sets us up to know much more about James Lewis, who you can probably already guess becomes the second major suspect in the poisonings. It also explains how he and his wife came to Chicago using false names, following which Leanne's employment unraveled to the point where the couple wanted to get even with McCahey. All for a bounced paycheck in the amount of $511 and change. Regarding the Lewis's attempt to punish McCahey, James Lewis was instrumental in trying to mobilize the travel agency's floor, former employees to take action with the Illinois Department of Labor. Lewis also had Leanne contact one of her former supervisors to get a list of McCahey's bank account numbers. I assume maybe to find out if they had any money left to go after. If you remember, the Tylenol extortion letter provided one of McCahey's bank account numbers. James Lewis also helped the former employees get a hearing with the Illinois Department of Labor. James was said to be the most outspoken of the group, even though he had never even worked for the travel agency, nor was any type of official representative for them. In fact, the person at the hearing finally told Lewis he needed to just sit in the corner and listen. When the meeting was almost over, McKay, he showed up. At that point, witnesses said that he and the Lewis couple began yelling at each other, ending with McKay, he threatening Leanne Lewis. Now, when their claim against McKay, he went nowhere. James and Leanne, or Robert and Nancy Richardson, as they were called the whole time they were in Chicago, well, they decided to leave town. Using the names William and Karen Wagner now, the couple bought one-way train tickets for New York City and left on September 4, 1982. That was 25 days before 12-year-old Mary Kellerman died from the cyanide lace Tylenol. Surprisingly, when the pair hit New York, they took back their Chicago names as Robert and Nancy Richardson. Authorities hadn't connected James and Leanne Lewis to any of this yet. I was just giving you the backstory. As for the investigation of the Tylenol murders, all police knew early on was that McKay's account number was in that extortion letter and that it was postmarked from New York just days after the poisonings. During the forensic analysis of the envelope, when investigators scratched the postmark away, they found an office postage meter stamp from McKay's travel agency dated April of 1982. Although police didn't know it yet, that was because Leanne Lewis had metered some blank envelopes when she still worked for McKay. She took them home and then months later used one of them to send the extortion letter from New York. So there were several lines leading to McKay, but he was kind of a prominent guy in the area. Police just didn't think he'd be foolish enough to implicate himself like that in either the extortion or the Tylenol killings. Among the first things they asked McKay was who might have been upset with him for some reason. He immediately said Robert and Nancy Richardson. It didn't take long for police to figure out the couple's legal names were James and Leanne Lewis. But they had left Chicago for New York by this time and no one really knew where they'd gone. Investigators initially thought the extortion letter was just a hoax to bring McKay into the limelight and embarrass him. But after police learned of James Lewis's connection to the Raymond West dismemberment case back in Kansas City, as well as the business and tax fraud that caused 
him to leave Missouri, well, then they reconsidered. By this time, the couple's faces and aliases were all over the media, and they needed to really drop out of sight quickly. Leanne quit the job she'd just gotten in New York. They moved out of their apartment and stopped using the names Robert and Nancy Richardson. People who knew the couple at one time or another started coming forward to the press and police at this time. Some said James Lewis was a near genius that could talk on almost any subject, but others said he was mentally unstable, cold, and vindictive. Things got really crazy when it was reported that Lewis had also written a threatening letter to President Ronald Reagan, alleging it was from McKay. Handwriting analysis showed the same person had written both letters, and they found Lewis's fingerprint on the extortion letter. Then Lewis began writing to the press just like some other killers have done, including Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, and Dennis Rader, the BTK killer. Lewis sent a package of material to a Chicago newspaper. The paper is related to the travel agency payroll default, I suppose to try and indicate that Framing McKay he was with good reason. But Lewis's letter stated that he and his wife did not commit the Tylenol murders. How could they after moving to New York weeks before the deaths? Co-workers saw Leanne Daly at her New York job and also saw James meet her for lunch and at the bus station daily. Authorities never did find any public transportation records to indicate either of them had returned to Chicago during the Tylenol killings. In another letter, Lewis mocked police for reopening the Raymond West case and again trying to connect him to it. Lewis began signing his real name. He even put his right thumbprint on one letter after the media reported the FBI had recently discovered Lewis's right thumbprint on the pulley system that had been used in the Raymond West case. Since Leanne, who generally supported them, had quit her job, they needed money. About two months after the Tylenol killings, a Manhattan Western Union surveillance camera captured Leanne picking up a $140 money order that had been sent to her by her father so authorities knew the couple was still in the area. But the big break came next when the FBI received a call from a New York public librarian who said she thought she had just given the wanted man, James Lewis, two references he had requested. One was a listing of newspaper outlets and their addresses, and he was still presently sitting at a table in the library. Agents immediately closed in and arrested Lewis, but really, all they had enough evidence to char charge him with was the extortion. Leanne turned herself in, and although investigators bargained with her to turn against her husband, she refused. The only thing they could charge her on was Social Security fraud for using identification that wasn't hers during her prior employment. About a year after the Tylenol killings, James Lewis was convicted of attempted extortion. He got 10 years in prison to be served consecutively with 10 years he got for other charges, like tax fraud. While in prison, Lewis wanted to work with the authorities to try to solve the poisonings. Now, they agreed in the hopes that maybe he would slip up. He didn't, but neither would he take a lie detector test. Lewis was a model prisoner for 13 years until his release in 1995. Good old Leanne was still waiting for him. Since then, Jim Lewis has been living in the Boston area. He maintains he was a political prisoner who served as a scapegoat for an inept investigation. Lewis says that while he sat in jail, and since he remains a prime suspect, the real Tylenol murderer has gone free. In 2004, Lewis was arrested for the rape and kidnapping of a woman in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Despite being held for three years awaiting trial, the case was dropped on the eve of the court proceedings because the victim decided she wouldn't testify. In 2009, the FBI searched Lewis's home as part of what they called a, quote, ongoing investigation, citing the possibility of new evidence and technological advances that might finally help them solve the crime. My guess is they were referring to what's called touch DNA testing, developed just about that same time, in which only a handful of human skin cells, maybe as few as six or eight, can create a DNA profile. Agents were seen leaving Lewis's home with boxes of papers and an Apple computer. 
They also searched a storage facility in the Cambridge area, but no charges were filed as a result. In 2010, the FBI asked James Lewis and his wife to submit DNA samples as well as fresh fingerprints, and they complied. Unbelievably, also in 2010, Lewis released a self-published novel that he had the audacity to title Poison. He gave a 45-minute interview to a Boston Public Access show to try to promote his book. You can find video clips of the interview on the internet. The whole thing is very bizarre. Lewis said the book is totally fictional and is set in the kind of rural area he grew up in. The storyline is about a well that's intentionally contaminated with mercury, causing people in the area to die. He said there's no message about the Tylenol case intended by his work, and he still maintains he had nothing to do with it. He's also said that if he had any idea of what the extortion letter did to the victims, by redirecting the investigation onto him instead of the real killer, well, he'd never have written the letter. Another strange twist. In 2011, the convicted and imprisoned so-called Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, was also asked by the FBI to submit a DNA sample for evaluation in the 1982 Tylenol killings. Now, he grew up in the Chicago area, and at the time of the Tylenol case, Kaczynski's parents still had a home there that he occasionally visited. Four of his attacks occurred in Chicago between 1978 and 1980. Kaczynski tried to bargain with the FBI, filing a motion saying he would give the sample only if they would stop the pending auction of his belongings, including items seized from the Montana cabin where he had lived. The auction was an attempt to raise money for his victims. The Unabomber said the 30,000 pages of his journals in particular would show he couldn't have committed the Tylenol poisoning, but the auction went on. 2012 marked the 30th anniversary of the Tylenol murders. That year, media reports indicated that a grand jury might finally be convened to indict James Lewis in the seven murders. That never happened. Even lead investigators on the case disagree on whether or not Lewis is actually responsible for the killings. Today, some describe the case as one of the earliest examples of what many would now call domestic or homegrown terrorism. Either James Lewis or somebody else randomly targeted the general public to cause fear. And I'm quoting here from one of the men involved in the investigation from its beginning. Bring the country to its knees. Since then, American, America and other places in the world have seen all too many examples of this kind of random violence. Cases in which targets aren't hand-selected by madmen who single out victims for their own demented reasons. Instead, we've seen the indiscriminate killings of groups of fellow Americans such as in the Sandy Hook and other school shootings, the Boston Marathon bombings, the shootings at Fort Hood, Texas, or the Oklahoma City bombing. Some experts disagree with calling the Tylenol killings terrorism because by their definition, terrorism involves a clear motive or goal that's politically or religiously motivated and also often involves a person or group that claims responsibility. At this point, the 1982 Tylenol deaths themselves are no mystery. In a span of just three days, seven people were killed using cyanide-laced acetaminophen, acetaminophen capsules. What remains unknown is who did this terrible thing and why. In the fall of 2013, the FBI announced it could no longer serve as lead investigator in the killings. The case has just grown too cold. Despite ever-advancing forensic technology, there are just no fresh clues, and all existing leads have been exhausted. I guess that means they still found no definitive connection to James Lewis, Ted Kaczynski, or anyone else at this point. Still, Chicago area police have not given up. Several agencies have started their own task force to continue to pursue the Tylenol killer.